uh, especially uh, given the horrible <laughs> weather outside. And I think the nice uh, full room is a, an excellent testament to the importance of the issue we'll be discussing today. And uh, it's our great pleasure. Uh, my name is Chris Johnson. I'm the Freeman Chair in China Studies here at CSIS. It's our great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Kai Fu Li here to uh, share his insight with us and to talk about his new book on uh, AI developments in China and uh, the race for AI. Um, Dr. Kai Fu Li is the chairman and CEO of Sinovision Ventures and president of Sinovation Ventures Artificial Intelligence Institute. Sinovation Ventures uh, is managing US $2 billion dollars in dual currency investment funds, is a leading venture capital firm focusing on developing the next generation of Chinese high-tech companies. Prior to uh, founding Sinova Sinovation in 2009, Dr. Li was the president of Google in China. Previously, he held executive positions at Microsoft, SGI, and Apple. Dr. Li received his bachelor's degree from, uh, in computer science from Columbia University and a PhD from Carnegie Mellon as well as honorary doctorate degrees from both Carnegie Mellon and the City University of Hong Kong. He's a fellow of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, uh, Times 100 in 2013, Wired 25 Icons, Asian Business Leader 2018 by Asia House, and followed by over 50 million uh, member audience on social media. So we're exceptionally blessed to have Dr. Kai Fu Li, and please welcome him to the stage. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, before I give my talk, I, know I, don't, I think many of you don't know me, so I'm going to have someone really, really famous introduce uh, this talk to you. No, not him. <laughs> it's a great thing to build a better world with artificial intelligence. Wait a sec. <laughs> so you knew President Trump's granddaughter spoke Chinese. You didn't know he spoke Chinese, right? <laughs> that wasn't him. That was a deep learning speech synthesis system developed by a Chinese company. All the voices, English and Chinese, were not spoken by him, but spoken by the AI system. So I think this simultaneously should show you how powerful machine learning is and how advanced China has become. So back to deep learning, this technology. I know many of you may not have um, a lot of um, uh, experience with machine learning and AI, so let me very briefly explain to you. When you think about machine learning don't and AI, don't think about all those dystopia, human intelligence, super intelligence. Those are things of the future. What to think about is a very narrow algorithm that only works in one domain, but when trained on a huge amount of training data with proper tagging of what's right and wrong, good and bad, win and lose, um, it learns at superhuman capabilities. So we've seen AlphaGo as an example. You can imagine a um, system that does loans, that does it with lower default rates than people, a system that makes investments, that invests at better returns than people, a system at Amazon that um, predicts what you might click on and show you the ads and get you to buy things. So these, that's what uh, deep learning and machine learning is. And uh, let me just go right into applications because that's what's exciting. That single machine learning, AI, deep learning technology is fueling a myriad of applications. It is not just for one use. It's very important to realize while the narrow AI is not as exciting as super intelligence or science fiction movies, it is omni-use technology that can be applied to all kinds of technology areas. So here we show the four waves of AI. Um, that I talk about in my book. And uh, the first wave is internet AI. When, of course, when we need one domain and a huge amount of data, who has more of that than internet companies? Amazon, we're all uh, basically contributing data and, uh, and we're all guinea pigs labeling for Google, Facebook, and Amazon every day. Every time you click on a Google ad, it knows what kind of things you might click on next time. Every time you click on a Facebook um, um, news feed, it knows what kind of things you like to read. And not only does it know about you, it knows people like you and all the people. So it can aggregate the data and make more accurate decisions. Effectively, what Amazon, Google, and Facebook have in their 
um, tool sets are a couple of knobs that they can tweak. Um, when you teach an AI system, you teach it to maximize or minimize an objective function. So that function could be maximize minutes used by all my users today, maximize u minutes used by this user per day, maximize the amount, number of times a user forward the information, thereby making it viral, maximize the revenue I collect today, maximize the revenue I would collect this month, maximize my profit for this quarter. So imagine if you're a CEO and you've got these little knobs, uh, wouldn't it be great? And that's how powerful it is, and that's why these internet companies are approaching trillion dollars. Of course, they're consumer internet brands, they build good products, they have large usage worldwide, but also equally importantly, when they have that much data, this magic knob uh, that AI gives them the ability to make so much money beyond belief. Beyond the internet AI, there's business AI, and that's AI used by banks, insurance companies, uh, using data they already have to, to make more money or to save costs. For example, a bank in the past may view its user customer transaction data as a cumbersome, costless cost center of archives that it has to store for legal and user requirements. But now that uh, cost center has become a gold mine because you can make money with it. You can use that customer transaction data to predict user behavior, to guess what they might want to buy, to push products to cause the users to buy, uh, to uh, determine credit card fraud, to decide if you want to make a loan to the user, to help him or her make a better asset allocation. So all those things are tools that banks can use. Just to make that real, give you an example, we invested in not a bank, but a, an app that does loans. And that app, of course, asks the user for name, address, uh, income, um, uh, place of work, and uh, you know, uh, net worth, and all, all those normal 10 questions. But it actually considers 3,000 things in deciding whether to give you the loan or not. And that turned out to be incredibly powerful. And where do we get the 3,000 things from? Well, from your cell phone. It's an app, you download it. So while you fill out the form, it says, well, you want to borrow $500? Well, do you agree to send me data from your cell phone? You're probably all scared. Oh my God, it's taking all my private stuff. No, it's taking nothing more, nothing less than what Android and iOS allows an app to take. So with that, plus the 10 things you filled out, it decides on whether to give you a loan or not. So it gives uh, loans on the order of $500. So how many of you would be willing to take $500,000 out of your account and uh, go out on the streets and then uh, see anyone who walks up to you who wants $500, give, the, give it to them, give it to 1,000 people. Uh, how much default rate do you think you'll have? 80%, <laughs> right? Something like that, right? So what default rate does this app have? 3%. So how could it possibly achieve that? Because those 3,000 features have minuscule correlations that humans cannot comprehend, but this mathematical algorithm does. So it considers things like, what day of the month is it? Why, why does it need that? Before or after your payday, right? After payday, not a good sign. Before the payday, okay. And it collects the number of seconds it took to type your address. It took you three minutes, it's not a good sign, right? You should know your address. With, you're not copying and paste from another list, are you? So, so it has all these things, plus it has what apps you've installed, right? If you have some apps to you know, buy marijuana or play games, well, that might not be good for you. If you have some really good you know, learn to invest and how to save more money apps or Quora or something like that, well, that may be good for you. Now, I'm not saying that's what the algorithm does, but those are the latitude that it has to consider. It goes as far as to consider what type of phone you have and, and also how much battery you have. That seems inconceivable, right? But it makes sense if you think about it. If you have OCD of plugging your phone all the time, you're probably somewhat correlated with the type of person who repays the loan, right? <laughs> if you are running out of battery all the time, you're probably a little bit correlated with someone who is not so responsible and doesn't pay back the loan. Of course, each of the features is a minuscule vote, and they all get combined together along with their correlations. 
and then to make the loan determination. That's how we got to 3%. So, but whether, I mean, I know some of you may think there may be bias issues and, and, and how can this matter and things like that. You can ask all the questions, but let's just look at the results. Uh, an amazing default rate that no human can possibly reach on basically zero cost. It's completely done by AI. So that should give you an idea of how powerful AI is when it's a single domain, huge amount of data. Okay, let's move on. Wave three is when the uh, AI can see and hear. So things that are transient in the environment get captured and then smart things are done with it. And if you talk to your Amazon Echo, uh, that's a good example of it. Uh, Amazon Go is a great vision that shows a future autonomous store in which it recognizes who you are, that you've entered, what you picked up, what you put in the basket, and then it checks you out without even going through a cashier and cash register. So that ability to see with cameras, microphones, and other sensors, sensors that could detect temperature, humidity, uh, movement, et cetera, and 3D reconstruction, uh, those can all be fed back into the, uh, back into the AI system um, to make smart determination. You know, face recognition is another one. Uh, an example in China about uh, three weeks ago, there was a famous Chinese singer, Jackie Chung from Hong Kong, who went through a circuit of, um, th I think, four cities uh, giving concerts. Uh, at the end of a concert, his concerts, I think about 30 criminals got arrested. So he became the most famous policeman in China. How did he do that? Well, the concert, because they hold 10,000 people for security reasons, they put in cameras. And then they connected the cameras to face recognition. And the face recognition, of course, had the criminal database connected to it. And a number of people were apprehended. Some were misidentified and sorry, it's our fault. <laughs> um, but, uh, but 30 of them got put away. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not advocating. The, this, this is a good universal application to each country will have its own practices, but I'm giving you an example of how powerful face recognition has gotten. I mean, if you gather the 10,000 smartest face recognizing forensics police face recognition person experts, you probably couldn't arrest that many people um, and find that many criminals or uh, moving away from the scenario, recognize that many faces, right? The, the, the list of most wanted criminals is probably easily tens of thousands of people, and humans just can't remember that many faces. So that's another application. And so in the future, we can imagine um, autonomous stores um, and um, usages in elderly homes. Someone might be falling down, and you recognize it and get um, elderly care uh, or a nurse to come by. And then moving to the fourth la layer is autonomous vehicles and robots. And that's where robots can be industrial, uh, commercial, uh, agricultural, or um, home. Home is actually the toughest one uh, because expectations are high, science fiction uh, set expectations. But agricultural, for example, is actually a wonderful use. You can use it to give um, uh, individualized uh, amounts of water fertilizer to each cabbage. You can sort your cucumbers from the most uh, you know, sellable to the least sellable. Uh, that was actually developed by, uh, I think, a college student uh, for, for his dad's farm in, in the Midwest somewhere. Um, and also, you can use it to pick fruits. You've got robot. Before, there's been robotics, but now robotics have, are combining hand-eye coordination. So think about this robot that has, uh, it's actually, none of these look like humans. So it's a little machine, but it's got cameras and it's got little uh, manipulators like fingers. So it's finding where the strawberries are and then hand-eye coordination grabbing the strawberries. So these applications are great and they're all happening in commercial applications, dishwashing robots, um, inspection robots, assembly line robots. Uh, of course, you're probably thinking job displacement, and yes, we'll talk about it in a moment. Um, and then autonomous vehicle, that's going to really disrupt the way transportation and logistics will work. Um, they are improving very rapidly, and uh, we can imagine a day when shared, um, a shared economy 
and the autonomous vehicle and the electrical mo uh, vehicles are combined together so that um, in the future we can uh, take ourselves from place A to place B with a much higher degree of safety, uh, less emissions problems, less traffic jams. We don't have to buy cars anymore because the shared economy, the car is the worst investment you've made. 96% of the time it's sitting idle, so you're, it's depreciating. Only 4% of the time are you getting use out of it, but in the future there's sharing economy, the car will be here uh, when you need it within 30 seconds and probably cost half as much as Uber or Lyft does today. Why is that? Because the human driver accounts for 75% of the cost of sharing economy. So by cutting out 75%, surely they, they could pass on some savings to us. So all these things will move us increasingly to an autonomous um, world in which autonomous drive, driving will get better and better with more data. All of these apps get better with data. They start with not enough data, maybe a little bit better than humans. In three or five years, they might be a lot better than humans. In 10 years, incredibly better drivers than humans. In 15 years, probably humans won't be allowed to drive anymore <laughs> because we pose the greatest danger. Imagine the autonomous vehicles can talk to each other. It's an IoT. Um, uh, one car can say, I have a flat tire. Stay away from me. Uh, or uh, two cars can negotiate to pass each other by just one centimeter. No, people can't do that. So those of you who love to drive, drive a lot in the next 25 years because car, you may not be allowed to drive after that. Um, but, but maybe, maybe um, just like, just, it's just like um, we can't ride horses onto um, in inter inter interstate freeways, right? Um, but however, if you want, love riding horses, you can still go to a horse farm. So in the future, there will be car farms where you can, <laughs> you can, still, you can still drive, perhaps. So these four waves are tremendous. And uh, they're enabled by uh, lots of data, tagging of what the, the, the grand truth is, uh, single domain, lots of power, and then AI, ex lots of compute power and AI experts. So a little bit on US and China, you would think US should lead in all of this. US invented AI, US invented deep learning, but actually there, are, and the US has 10 times as many top experts. This is the top thousand experts in the world. US is 68%, China is 6%. So with all this, why am I here? Why did I write the book? Why does China have a, have a chance? Well, there are three fundamental things you have to understand before writing off China. And they are, the first one is that there are only a few AI breakthroughs and they're reasonably well understood and they're open source. You know, because you read a lot of papers and you see AI can do this, AI can do that, you assume there is an exponential growth and all these brilliant scientists in America are keeping the American advantage. But that is not the case. In fact, there have been you know, small ideas here and there, including my own PhD thesis, but the big one was 2010 in deep learning. And now deep learning is reasonably well understood in terms of how to apply it to a new domain, and uh, even young people can, can use it. The second thing is that uh, we've gone from the early stage, the deep mind kind of um, cis company, PhD-led, uh, technology-led, looking for solutions. Um, when technology is not well understood, there may be only a thousand experts in the world. Now there might be hundreds of thousands of experts. What's important is that you're driven by an application that, that can make money. And you're led by a business person who uh, leads the company forward. And you do need AI experts, but maybe you don't need the best expert in the world. So when you really need the super experts, we saw that 68 to 6 advantage, US will be way ahead. But if it's about application, actually China has an interesting advantage. And all these open platforms lowers the barrier of developing AI applications. So um, you know, even relative novices can do very interesting things. So you see on the right, on the la on the right most, uh, actually for many applications, you don't need the super experts. Young engineers can do really interesting things. Here's an example. We trained 300 young engineers, uh, still in school. None of them have any industrial experience. In five weeks, one of the teams basically took, developed a deep learning system that on a toy car, it's a toy car, but autonomous nevertheless. And this is the picture of the car driving in the Peking University campus. You can see it's not without danger. It could have hit bicycles and people, but it actually, um, 
recognizes you know, forks in the road. It has built a complete high definition digital map. It knows how to avoid people, skateboards and bicycles and can recognize them and signs. So this is all done by 10 students who are still in undergraduates in China, led by a, an experienced person, of course, but the team built everything with open source. So do not think anymore that AI has this huge barrier or US has this huge lead. Application of AI is not that hard. It just depends on how many enterprising entrepreneurs and, and uh, hardworking engineers who really learn this stuff uh, you have. So to go further into these three points, well, China has a lot of young uh, entrepreneurs, engineers. The number of papers, if we ignore top 1,000 and go to any paper, China has 48% of the world's papers in AI. So it is uh, larger than its population. These are entering at the bottom of the pyramid, but over time, they'll get to the top. And then the right are some pictures of uh, Chinese students. And then secondly, Chinese entrepreneurs are innovative now. Um, 10 years ago, a lot of um, Chinese companies are characterized as Google of China, Amazon of China, Yahoo of China, because they took the concept to China. But, those, but about uh, seven or eight years ago, Chinese companies began to have small innovations. They took an American idea and actually made it better, more localized, better, easier to use. So today, some of you may have WeChat and WhatsApp. Um, do, do you find WhatsApp, what, which is better to use, WeChat or WhatsApp? Those of you who have both apps, who finds WeChat to be easier to use? Who finds WhatsApp to be easier to use? So there you have it. <laughs> uh, Weibo and Twitter, another example. Weibo is a lot easier to use than Twitter. Maybe not in the diversity of content, <laughs> but, uh, but it, it is a better user interface, like WeChat. Not every Chinese product is better. Some American products are great. But I'm just saying China has kind of caught up uh, seven year, five to seven years ago, building decent products for local users. But what's really important is the orange third column. That's when China began to be innovative. These are products that don't exist here. So Toutiao, um, uh, uh, Douyin, TikTok, Kuaishou, uh, VIP Kid, Mobike, uh, and Financial, Pinduoduo are all examples that don't exist in the US. I'll just give you one example between two products called TikTok and Kuaishou. Uh, they collectively have 200 million daily active users. So this is a huge, I mean, there are very few products that, this, this, this is not users, this is daily, that means 200 million users use these two products every day. And what do these products do? They are video-based social networks. Something new, don't have it in US, right? Uh, some people tried. You know, Vine was an attempt, but failed. It was the wrong user interface. But the Chinese figured out what the user interface should be. So now we're in the era of copy from China. So China has now caught up and is able to innovate at the product level. That has led to this world where uh, US and China are in two parallel universes. People ask me very often, Google, Facebook, will they succeed in China? Well, we have two parallel universes. Entering from one to go to the other is quite difficult. Um, and if you go to China, you will see that in many ways, China's mobile internet is more advanced than the American mobile internet. So no longer is China a copycat, it's even quite uh, innovative. And how did the, ch so in the process of building these innovative apps, China trained these uh, very good entrepreneurs who are also great entrepreneurs for AI. And how did they get trained? Um, in short, they're trained by, in an environment that believes in winner take all. And, and with very tough competition, no holds barred. I use the Gladiator as an example. Um, you know, they're used, why, why, why did that happen? Because there, are a lot of copy, there were a lot of copycats in China. So the only way you can win at the end is to be the only one left standing in the Colosseum. And the only way you can get to be the last one standing is by building a product that's uncopyable, impregnable. So how do you ever do that? Well, I have to get my book to see. <laughs> I, I would tell you, but I'm running out of time. Um, and then uh, I want to talk more about AI. So, uh, and then the other reason is China has more capital. 48% uh, of the world's AI VC went to China, 38% to US. Uh, just our VC, Sinovation alone, has made uh, five unicorns, totally valued at 21 billion. 
and there are 10 other AI unicorns. These are not, we've made 15 unicorns, five of which are AI. And that's all within the last two to four years. These companies started, with one exception, started not more than four years ago. So that's how fast China is running. And today, the world's most valuable speech recognition, machine translation, uh, computer vision, and drone companies are all Chinese. And another very important part is uh, that large amount of data. Um, the, what's important about, about AI is the more data, the better it performs. So the right-hand side actually shows you a very typical thing is that when you have more data, the performance just improves, regardless of what algorithm, as long as they're reasonable. So in the age of AI, data really is the new oil, and China is the new OPEC. Um, I decided to change, change Saudi Arabia to OPEC for obvious reasons. Um, the, why, why does China have so much data? A lot of people assume it's kind of privacy related. I mean, that's not, that's, that is a factor, but much bigger issue is China has more breadth and depth. More breadth because there are more users, and more depth because Chinese people actually use, contribute more data by using the apps more. Okay, for example, uh, the Chinese food delivery is 10 times more than the US, bike rides 300 times, and mobile payment 50 times. In particular, in mobile payment, the Chinese use of mobile payment has exceeded the China's GDP. If you go to China, you can hardly find people who accept cash, and there are fewer and fewer merchants that accept credit cards. I mean, when you go, you probably go to five-star hotels, you're okay. But w once you go to a normal store, uh, increasingly, they really, really, really prefer or perhaps only accept uh, WeChat Pay and Alipay. And uh, you will see that in farmers markets, even beggars, they're holding up signs that says, I'm hungry, scam me. <laughs> not, not joking, <laughs> we really saw that on Beijing Tianqiao not too long ago. So what does this mean? This means, um, well, this means partly America is paying a 2% tax for the credit cards, which add really no value to you. So time to rethink that. Um, but also means China has a ton more training data. Right? Remember, data is the new oil, and payment is the best form of data because it is a commitment to spend money. It is not just a click on Facebook. Okay? And of course, Chinese government uh, has policies that are very much pro-tech. And I call China techno-utilitarian, which means when a new technology comes out, China will generally let it launch, watch how it goes, and regulate it when it's needed. Um, so in the case of AI, in the case, sorry, in the case of um, mobile payment um, in the US, that might have been slowed down or stopped with credit card companies crying foul, saying, well, hey, software companies can't manage uh, money, they can't uh, prevent fraud, there are hacks and things like that, and there will be lobbying and things like that. But in China, the government said, okay, we'll give you a shot. And then Alibaba and Tencent proved that they were worthy, and then they became the golden standard. And that's, the, that's how techno-utilitarian policies work. Whereas in the US and Europe, I think people want to vet all the issues and finally come up with the rules and regulations before it launches. China, of course, also uh, sets the tone by saying AI is super important. But, but actually, a lot of people think the Chinese government just goes and decides who's the winner. That's not the case. The government sets a tone, and actually each, uh, each province or city or each state-owned enterprise makes its own decisions. So once this came out, we found that banks were more willing to buy AI software, uh, much to our uh, happiness, because we invested in such a company to sell AI software to banks. And the city of Nanjing, because it has great universities, decided to build a giant AI park with, I think, two million square feet or something like that. And then in the Xiong'an is a new city built for autonomous vehicles. This is a big infrastructure spend. And to give you an example of what it's doing is, you know, probably read recently Waymo CEO talking about L5 could be many decades away. Well, how does China do something about it? US is ahead in that technology. Well, the city of Xiong'an in the downtown has uh, top layer, the normal road uh, for pedestrians, pets, and bicycles and skateboards. And then the bottom layer, or B1, a giant, imagine a giant B1 layer, basement layer, for cars. So that would avoid 
the occurrence of what happened in Phoenix with the Uber autonomous driving. And that is the largest um, and, and the most dangerous type of casualty that autonomous drivers can cause, uh, driving can cause. So it's possible that even with technologies behind the US, uh, an infrastructure like downtown Xiong'an might launch first and then collect more data and get better. It does, it's no guarantee, but it's a possibility. So this is roughly where I think US and China stand. This only represents, only represents um, implementation, monetization. This is not about research. US is ahead in research. 11 to 1 is about right. China is way behind and will take a long time to catch up in research. However, most researchers publish and many researchers put things in open source. So when you really measure competitiveness in terms of applications, China has gone from way behind to catching up and to soon to be a little bit ahead of the US. And all this will propel AI forward, so much so that PwC estimates it will be almost $16 trillion of net incremental GDP in just another 11 years. So with all that wealth, we can do a lot of great things, such as reduce poverty and hunger, but it will also bring up a lot of issues. I think people talk a lot about privacy security bias, so I'm going to choose to something different to talk about, which I care a lot about, I'm very concerned about, and it's job displacement. Because as a VC, we invested in 45 AI companies. Seven of them are doing work that would displace jobs, and in aggregate, a lot of jobs. So what jobs will that re replace? Well, we've talked about uh, AI is very good in a single domain routine repetitive task, right? Giving loans, uh, washing dishes, picking fruits, um, and um, uh, customer service and telemarketing uh, and uh, things like that. So the jobs that are the most repetitive and routine will be replaced fairly soon. And then um, even jobs like radiologists may not be fully safe. Uh, only safe are the complex jobs and creative jobs. So fortunately, most of us are OK. <laughs> uh, however, why, why are com complex jobs safe? Because that's not single domain. Why are creative jobs safe? Because that's creating something new from nothing, not optimizing an objective function. So when we look at white collar and blue collar jobs, they're really being displaced right now. Beginning, very beginning of displacement right now. You've seen the city warning, you look at the trading floor. It's not just by AI, but by automation and software. And then blue collar jobs, um, the, the mid, this picture is one of, uh, if you ever go to Guangzhou, please go there to eat uh, for, it's an autonomous fast food. And it's about a dollar fifty to two dollars uh, per lunch. You can get a bowl of uh, beef noodles or fish ball noodle soup, um, and it's uh, filling, tasty, and uh, much less than McDonald's. So, how will that displace jobs? Well, to the extent autonomous fast food takes away share from companies like McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chicken, well, that will be lost jobs that way. Of course, you can also displace jobs one on one, such as with this uh, checkout for the pastry which we also uh, funded. So with many people who might be displaced, um, what will happen? Can AI create a lot of jobs? Probably. But how long will it take? We don't know. And what kind of jobs might AI create? Are the people who are displaced from routine jobs able to easily be trained into the new jobs that AI create? Very, very questionable. But we can ask another question, which is, what really can AI not do? And what are the core things AI cannot do? We've talked about AI cannot do creation or strategy. But another thing is that AI has no self-awareness, love, compassion, or empathy. And people still want to work with other people on things that require trust, respect, and human connection. So rather than a one-dimensional graph, we really should make it two-dimensional. X-axis for creativity, Y-axis for compassion. And then if we put these jobs in their place, we'll see the lower left-hand jobs are becoming dangerous over the next 15 years. However, uh, there are many other jobs that are, exist or can, will expand or can be created uh, that are, require a high degree of compassion or empathy. Uh, an example is elderly care. Um, we're going to live longer. Longevity causes there to be an elderly population. Uh, people over 80 require five times as much care as people from 60 to 80. So that need is going to be there. And then some people will say, well, elderly, let's make some robots to take care of them. 
but that really isn't the right thing to do. We actually had an entrepreneur who showed me a prototype of a robot to take care of an elderly person, and he told me the number one use function was customer service. And the elderly person clicks on customer service, a customer service rep comes on the, you know, the, 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 you know, the chest of the robot, and then the elderly person says, why didn't my daughter call me today? Let me show you a picture of my granddaughter. So, so the elderly people, as you know, your parents, yourselves, your grandparents, don't want to be taken care of by robots. So this is a growing opportunity. The only issue is it's not paid enough. So we just have to do something that makes sure these jobs grow and are paid enough. And then the migration from lo lower left to lo upper left might be able to happen. So this graph actually shows you the coexistence of human and AI. With the lower left-hand job, will be replaced by AI. We have to accept that. But AI will be a great tool that will enhance uh, human creativity, helping scientists create more drugs and discoveries. And, and um, upper left will be actually AI doing the analysis with human wrapping warmth around it. For example, a future doctor might rely on an AI diagnostic tool for what the disease is and how to treat it. But the doctor would talk to the patient, hear all the issues and family history, feed it to the AI engine, give the patient comfort, visit the patient at home, and be available, spend 30 minutes, not five minutes with the patient, giving the patient the comfort, confidence that he or she will, uh, will recover. So, so that uh, symbiosis will actually create more jobs, make the cost of healthcare lower. The same with teachers. So we can imagine the upper left will be an interesting area of human AI uh, symbiosis, different from the lower right. And of course, the upper right will be one that humans will continue to shine with both uh, the unique human compassion and creativity. So that talks about the opportunities and challenges of AI for the next 20 years. But I do want to look, look a little further out, maybe 40 or 50 years out, because when all the chaos is dealt with and fixed, all the jobs settle down, I think we'll come back and really thank AI, because AI will have liberated us from doing routine work. It's going to be challenging to get over it, but once we're liberated from routine work, we can do what we love and find what it takes why it is that we are here on this earth. And for people who fear AI, remember AI today that we talked about is really just a tool, a tool that we control, a tool that has no free will, a tool that will not control us, and that we are the only ones who have free will, and we're the ones who will write the ending to the future of the AI story. Thank you. That was really a fantastic presentation, and your, your book is really terrific. Um, it, it, it's um, not, not only are you uh, a pioneer in the field, but you're a popularizer as well to, to try and take things which are amazingly complex and difficult for anyone to understand and explain them uh, to a broader audience. And, and that's really important in Washington. I think one of the goals of um, CSIS and, and certainly the China Innovation Policy Series uh, that I head uh, is to make policy decisions fact-based, to provide more facts uh, rather than base decisions on ideology or uh, other types of political preferences. And um, this, you're doing a great service, not just for folks who are in business or, or potential consumers, but for the policy community uh, as well. Um, I, have, I want to ask a few questions uh, and then open things up to the floor and then also give some time at the end for uh, folks to get a copy of your book uh, and, and have your autograph attached to it. Um, if I remember correctly, one of the first experiences that you had uh, with AI was when you developed the software for Othello. Mm -hmm. which, and I've got one of those games in my house still that shows you uh, my age. Um, and I won't lend it to anybody. Uh, how, how did you transition from thinking about how to write a program to make a, a game high performance to, to then starting to think about many of these other ways that you could apply this technology and the, the large social ramifications that it would have? When did, when did that light bulb go on that you weren't just working on games? 
oh, you know, PhD training is actually a terrible, terrible thing if you ever want to be a CEO because you have to undo a lot of things that and practices you have when you're studying the PhD. So when I was studying the PhD, I was like any other geek. Um, you solve a problem because it's there. You want to do something because no one has done it before. Those were the only reasons you ever need to do something. But when that becomes a habit, um, you actually don't do things that CEOs, in particular entrepreneurs, need to do, which is solve a problem with a minimal risk. That is better to use open source and not invent anything. And starting a company is, uh, and doing a business is it hard enough. You've got competitive risk, market risk, um, you know, um, uh, mem uh, team uh, the empl employee risk and um, risks with um, uh, execution. Uh, you just don't need to take a research te technology risk. So being a good CEO and entrepreneur, in some cases, almost the opposite logic of, um, of, of a PhD. So after I got my PhD, I went to work at Apple, thinking we'll just change the world by putting speech into Macs. That didn't work. Then I went to SGI, thinking that we would put 3D into web browsers. That didn't work. <laughs> and then I went back to research at Microsoft, where I both did some good research and learned about business. Uh, and then it was really at Microsoft and Google that I learned uh, um, really to rethink about business opportunities as opposed to just do what's new. Terrific, terrific. Um, I've been going to China for 30 years now. Uh, a lot of people here are familiar with China. You've uh, lived on both sides of the strait. Um, one of the things that, that I sense when I'm in China, and that is a common, it has to do with interpersonal trust, and or uh, not uh, trust with folks who are not in your immediate family, um, and which has always seemed to always been a problem. Um, does AI solve the interpersonal trust problem in China, or does the way that AI evolves in China reflect the underlying trust problems? Is it is, is it help to address some of that? I think technology solves it. I'm not sure AI in particular is, yeah. is that important. Taking as an example, in the early days that um, uh, eBay went to China, yes. right? Uh, they had this reputation system, um, but it kept getting gamed in China uh, in those early stages because you know someone could sell a one dollar product fifty times and get a very high rating. Then they sell a thousand dollar product and never ship to you. So. Um, and eBay didn't localize this to about trust. I think trust needs to be built over time. So Taobao came up with this very clever idea that uh, it's, it's not a new idea, it's just escrow payment. So you pay the money, Taobao holds it, sends the merchandise, only once the merchandise is, re is received is the are the funds re re released. So that was a very clever example when there wasn't enough trust to build up trust. But you can see China as a society is getting closer to Western society, at least in terms of um, uh, internet-based trust building, uh, because now very few people still uh, rely on the escrow trust. Companies like JD have emerged that largely require that you pay up front. So I think the lack of trust kind of uh, was helped to reduce getting closer to Western norm uh, with the advent of e-commerce. Um, that would be my best example. Yeah, so I was thinking in the book you talk a, a little bit about potential applications like legal applications and going to court. And most folks who have experience going to Chinese courts don't have a very happy experience. Because uh, we know that, yes, you could create um, an algorithm that says, look at the evidence, look at all the different photos and everything. But in Chinese courts, it, uh, guanxi connections might matter a little bit. So I don't know if an AI algorithm is going to add uh, a little bit about connections. But may maybe, actually, it might just make decision making by judges much more straightforward. And then might, people might trust the, the, the legal system more in China? Uh, it's hard to speculate on that, but I, I can say that the deployment of AI in, in courts is faster in China. And um, there may be a number of reasons behind it, uh, one of which is just that it's a useful tool to judges who are less experienced, right? Mm -hmm. Because you know a Beijing court judge is probably very experienced, but a village or a town judge may be less experienced. But if you had a tool that could suggest to you, based on all the evidences you saw, what contradictions were there, and um, during the examination were there any inconsistencies in the report taken versus the 
uh, uh, speech and video records of the interrogation. Uh, those, I think, could help the um, uh, delivery of justice. Furthermore, a sentencing tool that suggests to the judge that the norm for sentencing, should the person be found guilty, is this range, could be helpful to less experienced judges. I know many people here would find it quite concerned for those to be adopted. But if you think about the disparity of quality of judges, uh, as well as the problems you mentioned, uh, this is, for one, a tool that could enhance and create more consistency across judges. Right? Consistency is a big issue across any country. Even in Israel, they did a study and found that judges were tougher before lunch than after lunch. So, so that's a consistency from hungry to full. That's, uh, so I think so AI could add consistency. But it's also important that such AI uh, are explainable and are not too quickly put into practice and that experienced judges can overrule the AI or actually should view the AI just as a reference point. So to the extent those are done, I think it would be useful. I also think another use of this is sort of to score the judges. Uh, it may not be an absolute score, but it would say, well, if this judge uh, decisions are, you know, um, negative 40 percent, negative 40 percent decorrelated correlated with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, AI, well, maybe someone should look deeply to see if there are possible guanxi or corruption issues. Okay. Again, not letting the AI be the judge of judges, but letting it be a trigger of uh, points of audit. So these are the areas in which it's deployed. Terrific. Um, as you know, um, even though you're in business, and perhaps because you're in business, the, the uh, U.S. and Chinese governments uh, um, have a difficult relationship right now. And the U.S. has uh, already put tariffs on lots of Chinese goods. The Chinese have retaliated. Uh, the U.S. has uh, uh, revised its foreign investment laws uh, in the middle of doing the same with export controls. Uh, we've talked about deemed export restrictions uh, regarding uh, uh, employees who move from one firm, perhaps potentially to a Chinese company, uh, visa restrictions possibly for students. Um, is it possible, if, if, if the U.S. turned the dial on all of these, um, would, would China's march toward AI slow down very much, or is basically China have enough indigenous knowledge uh, data, uh, hardware, to, to, to succeed regardless of what the U.S. does? Um, yeah, I, I think China, as I mentioned here, in terms of commercializing AI, I think China has more or less everything it needs to move forward. Um, and um, it's not the case that U.S. has all these super secret AI know-how that these measures would actually substantially change. I think that's probably the one key me uh, policy point that may be most relevant to DC. Now, you could obviously come up with examples that may not be true. China still has a significant dependency on American semiconductors. Uh, but then Shenzhen makes most of American products. So I would hate to see further escalation because it will end up to be a larger lose-lose um, if that happens. Sure. Um, OK, last question I'll ask. Um, the U.S. and China, both very large markets, uh, lots of research, commercialization domestically, but of course, we're both looking to uh, export, invest abroad. It's a big world out there. Uh, it's only going to get bigger. How do you foresee the U.S.-China cooperation and competition for markets uh, beyond our two countries uh, in, the, in the rest of Asia, along the Belt and Road, in Europe? Uh, what, what do you think that uh, landscape is going to look like? Um, I think in terms of exporting software to other countries, U.S. Is obviously has way more experience doing that and is way ahead right now. But I think uh, U.S. Uh, can only be guaranteed of retaining its uh, super supremacy in developed countries, uh, Europe, English-speaking countries, and so on, uh, Japan, and so on. But, but um, I think China really has a chance in developing countries, especially Southeast Asia and Africa to a lesser extent, Middle East, India. And actually, a lot of Chinese software, including a few I named, like TikTok and Kuaishou, they have been exported quite successfully to some of these regions. Um, I think TikTok has a million daily active users in Africa today. Um, and actually, there are a lot of Chinese 
new Chinese copycats who are copying Chinese innovations to various developing countries. So it's going faster, and also there are alliances being made. DD is partnering with competitors of Uber in, uh, in developing countries uh, to give them cash investments for a percentage of the company and injecting technologies, in, in, including AI. So I would actually foresee five years further down the road, China will make significant inroads um, coincidentally along the One Bell, One Road uh, uh, path. Okay. Terrific. I think uh, my job was just to get the ball rolling. Uh, We've got a lot of folks out there who've got their hands up. We've got one or two microphones that'll be circulating. Uh, we have a big online audience, and so please wait for the microphone to come your way. And if you would uh, keep your, first identify yourself and keep your comments uh, as brief as possible, we're gonna come right here in the front, uh, or third, on the aisle, uh, third row. Uh, Peter Humphrey, I'm an Intel analyst and a former diplomat. Um, can you uh, generalize what the coding language people are using these days in China is? And uh, second, can you tell us, uh, since China now has something worth stealing, um, will that change its outlook vis-a-vis -vis theft, digital theft? You know, n now, now the shoe's on the other foot kind of thing. Okay. Uh, the, well, the primary programming language for AI is actually Python. Uh, which is incredibly easy to learn if you have kids encouraging them to learn it. Um, and then Python can then be connected to either PyTorch by Facebook, uh, TensorFlow by Google. And these are actually, uh, especially TensorFlow is quite popular in China. Uh, it's open source, the open source version. Um, and on the second question, uh, just to clarify, uh, we have never invested in any company that had IP theft from any country. Uh, it's our principle not to do that. In general, internet, mobile, and um, uh, AI are not spaces where we see IP theft. Um, other areas, obviously, we have seen publicized cases. Um, so I think, I think if you view China's general view about IP as pragmatic, um, we can see from the evidence in movies and songs um, that uh, China as a market and China as a co-producer of movies, when there's aligned interest, and when there is a more balanced money going and money coming, there is a likelihood of reaching some kind of accord, right? Um, there used to be nothing but pirated movies and songs in China. Now there's nothing but legal. I think it's even more legal than I see in the US. I still see people here rip songs from here and there. But in China, it's all available through these channels that are provided. So I certainly think China is, um, at a general level, uh, creating more IP. And I think IP is a point that I think um, is incontrovertible. It's something countries should respect. And I would expect there uh, to be movement um, uh, for all these reasons. OK. All right, um, we're going to come right here in the fourth round. That's right. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Katie Wang with NTD TV. I have two questions. Uh, one is about the AI uh, technology. Uh, earlier this year, we have seen that uh, Google employees had a protest regarding the um, their uh, participation in the um, DOD, the Defense Department project uh, regarding the uh, developing some um, like uh, automatic weapons, lethal weapons, and so uh, they have. They think this involves morality issues. So they had the protest and later on, maybe the uh, Google decided to um, discontinue the contract with DOD. Um, but in China recently, there are 31 high school graduate students who were hired by the gov recruited by government to, um, to um, doing the research and development of the weapons, uh, lethal weapons. So um, I'm wondering <laughs> this, uh, because AI technology could involve uh, these morality issues. Uh, is there any, that could, how do you take this um, issue um, in China, especially this is a totalitarian countries government can control uh, and the company may not have such free choices? And okay. Let's, okay. Can we keep it to one question yeah. just because of the Thank time? You. Thanks okay. a lot. Yeah, um, I think Google kind of stands out on its own. Um, Amazon, Microsoft, um, other companies seem to have more willingness to work with the government on a wider 
number of projects. And I guess to each company, its own set of um, decision boundaries. Um, and then in terms of uh, each country hiring young people to work on defense and or intelligence, I guess that happens in every country. Uh, some of the smartest researchers I've met in the U.S. work for the NSA. So I, I don't really see a large distinction there. Okay, we're gonna go back. Yes, this gentleman right there. Hi, uh, my name is Sajish Krishnan. I'm a tech entrepreneur. Um, I have a question regarding the, the first slide you showed with President Trump's um, statements. So that raises a question today. We live in a world of fake news and deep fakes and, and all of that. And um, I presume AI could exacerb exacerbate that problem. And I'm curious about your views and, and are there steps being taken to ensure that uh, AI is being used in the right way versus um, maybe further propagating all of the issues that we have today? Uh, yes, I think there are many issues. Uh, you brought up a very good one. Um, if I were to prioritize, I would say security is actually the largest issue uh, that immediately faces us, hacking into algorithms, data, and uh, autonomous vehicles and the like. Uh, job displacement is a, is a big issue waiting in the horizon, not yet immediately obvious. Uh, your issue is probably somewhere up there in the top uh, you know, five or six. Um, there are possible, every, for every measure, there's a countermeasure. Um, just for fun, recently, ten, I don't know if you know a very popular Chinese app called Meitu. It's called um, Beauty Plus in the US. It basically makes your selfie look prettier. Sometimes uh, you can dial it up pretty extreme. That, <laughs> that, that, that's why a lot of uh, Chinese singles date each other and say, wow, that's not what your picture looks like. Uh, there was a recent release of a product by Tencent that undoes what Meitu does. <laughs> so by same principle, I mean, both Meitu and Tencent product works our AI products, right? Because they're based on people using, selecting, not using, not selecting the apps and then getting feedback. And then they have certain algorithms. So I guess one could also um, automatically recognize that wasn't truly President Trump speaking and it was created by a speech synthesis. In fact, I was um, giving this demo to um, one of my friends um, who used to be a leading speech synthesis researcher and then he heard it and says, that doesn't sound like President Trump at all. So, so to experts' ears, they can tell. And therefore, there will be AI countermeasures possible to detect that. OK, we're going to get the second row right here, this lady right here. I'm Chia Cheng with United Day News Group Taiwan. So you've mentioned that US is leading in research, and China is catching up in the application. Right. So what about um, use of AI in military? And how long does it take for the other to catch up the current leader? Thank you. Well, I really don't know, because we're a venture capitalist. Um, both countries, military and intelligence group, don't talk to us. So I have no idea. And actually, I, I would guess very, little, very few people know. Uh, right? I would guess these are both kept rather uh, secret. Um, but if, if, if you were to guess, I think both countries have a lot of very smart engineers. They both should be able to do interesting things. But it's really hard. I can't possibly judge. Mm. Let, me, let me just step in, not about the military, but about one of the applications you mentioned, uh, uh, autonomous driving. Uh, we've got a report coming out soon that looks at new energy vehicles and autonomous uh, that we've been working on for a while. And I'm... I guess I'm kind of a skeptic about autonomous because um, maybe it's maybe it's because I live in the United States and people love their cars uh, and we're we're attached to them and the brands. Uh, but even when I'm in China, I find Chinese people so brand conscious mm -hmm. and status oriented mm -hmm. that they yeah. might not want to necessarily give up the cars. And, and if you drive in Beijing or other cities, people uh, seem to to you know, think that their cars are super important symbols and identifiers of themselves. So do you think that that might, that the brand consciousness of Chinese or status consciousness of the Chinese, rather than the technology side of this, might slow down AI, autonomous vehicle deployment in China? Very interesting. Well, first, I think um, Americans, um, I mean, part of the American dream was what Ford put out, right? Yes. The, the vision statement of Ford 
was so that every American could afford an automobile and see how beautiful this country is. Yes. And that has led to this belief and, and uh, all the people feeling strong sense of attachment to their cars and their brands. And, and I would put forth that this may become a handicap for America's wider adoption of autonomous vehicles because the, right, the best form of autonomous vehicle ought to be shared as opposed to owned. And China doesn't yet have this strong a sense of ownership. And you're absolutely right that China has a stronger sense of brand, but it largely pertains to luxury brands. So I would guess in the first of, let's say uh, L4 worked uh, in a couple of years. And I would guess people who buy Rolls Royce, Bentley, um, and uh, you know, Porsche will continue to do that. Uh, but people who buy uh, you know, ordinary cars uh, will probably be much more willing to, to, to switch over. And I would further say that um, just like today in China, there are tiers of Uber. The tiers are clearer. In, in the U.S., you have yes. Uber Black, right? Yes. You know, in, in China, there is the, uh, the fancy version of DD, and then there's the Shenzhou Zhuanzhe, which is kind of viewed <laughs> as even higher level. Yes. So in the future, there could be a Rolls Royce, uh, uh, you know, special car that you always ride. And every time you want a car, it's a Rolls Royce. Um, that will satisfy, perhaps satisfy the brand. Uh, maybe not the ownership. And maybe it'll be a red flag or something like that. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to come back. We're going to get this gentleman on the road there. On the Actually, Ben Lee's, I think, sells really well. Yes. Yes. Thank you for this great presentation. Um, you depicted. Can you identify Chi yourself? Oh, yeah, sure. Bill Clifford, World Affairs Councils of America. You depicted China catching up and overtaking the U.S. in many areas. Could you just for perspective uh, indicate where in patents or other metrics Europe and Japan might be in the AI competition? Yeah. And separately, it, toward the end, your presentation got to uh, the job displacement issue. Is that an argument in your view for universal basic income? Okay. Okay, so the first question, um, a lot of the AI algorithms are really in the open space. So that's why the amount of data, the tenacity of the entrepreneurs, and the number of good engineers, not amazing engineers, matters a lot. And that's what put China ahead. Um, I, think, um, I think also important is the availability of capital and sophisticated VCs to help the entrepreneurs along. So Japan and Europe are both uh, very much lagging in these aspects. Um, there's a lot of data in Europe, but there's more restrictions. Uh, there are not the tenacious, there are neither the Chinese tenacious entrepreneurs in Europe, nor the American brilliant entrepreneurs in quantity in Europe. And the same might be said in, in Japan. Um, and the work ethic and things like that is also hard to project a uh, great future uh, for either Europe or Japan in this race. So, you know, they will obviously be in third, fourth positions, but when the market share numbers or the market cap numbers are, you know, uh, 50, 40, you know, 6, 1, you know, then it's not that interesting. So I think they have chances to do something. In fact, I think today, if I were to, to ask, to be asked who's really doing something about it, I think Canada is probably doing the best job. Uh, and, and it's an unusual candidate because, well, two of the three inventors of deep learning live in Canada, and then they've attracted a lot of talent. And also the American visa issues have given China, Canada the biggest gift. So now they have a lot of engineers. So if I were to bet on one, I mean, Canada won't beat EU in its AI revenue, but proportional to its population size or compared to relative to our expectations, Canada will probably be the black horse, if I were to guess. On the universal basic income, um, I'm, I'm really not for it. I think a redistribution is needed and is likely through taxation. I'm, I'm with it. I'm with universal basic income up to that point. But then I think um, the loss of income is only a small part of the issue. The loss of meaning is a bigger issue. Um, hi uh, history has told us uh, statistically that uh, people who are um, unemployed for six to 12 months have a much higher likelihood of depression, suicide, substance abuse. So I think the right answer has to be uh, re-employment of the people who are displaced. Uh, even though AI may create jobs that are hard to train for, uh, we need to find some way to train, um, whether it's a one-year training or four-year training. Uh, I find Jeff Bezos' uh, recent announcement about Amazon corporate training, $12,000 reimbursement per month times four years, to be very enlightening. 
that I think he and his head knows that his warehouse employees and his cashiers are going to be displaced. Um, and, um, and also, I think he would like to help them so that even if Amazon didn't have a job for them, there would be training to something that they can find a job um, and, and, and in, a, in a very, um, uh, with, with dignity and decent pay um, and meaning. And the types of jobs you see that Amazon's asking its employees to, re that would reimburse, they don't reimburse every type of training, um, but they do reimburse jobs like aeronautic repair, something AI definitely can't do for a long time. Nurses, something AI can't do for a long time. So I'm becoming a Jeff Bezos fan if what I interpret is correct. Well, he's going to have an office in our neighborhood in just a few months, so uh, we're, we're happy to have him by. Let me just, uh, there's a few, let me just interject with one question, uh, because uh, although th this is a book about China and the U.S.-China race, and I just want to ask you more about another question about U.S. policy. Irrespective of the China competition, um, Where's the biggest gap in what the U.S. government could do? Is it about funding? It seems like we've got enough R&D going on, and we've got plenty of engineers we're creating. Is it? On, but maybe it's on the demand side, or getting rid of the obstacles for demand, or is it about the job retraining side to deal with the problem that you just discussed? Where's the biggest one hole where Washington might be able to make a significant difference? Well, I think the biggest one, the biggest. Um uh, unknown factor is when's the next breakthrough coming. Mm -hmm. Because once that comes, everything I said could be changed. Um, that would be a good chance to write my second book. Yes. Um, but if you ask who's most like, what country is most likely to make the breakthrough, it's clearly the United States. How do, does the U.S. increase its chance of making the breakthrough? Well, increase funding, um, open immigration for researchers and smart students, uh, make them easier for them to stay, get a visa. Uh, increase the pay or help help uh, university professors not getting poached by you know Google and uh, Facebook and uh, Tencent and Alibaba, um, and um, um, yeah, and, and and I think that's the single biggest thing. There are a lot of other things uh, that could be done, but um, I mean, the, the likelihood of the next breakthrough is not predictable. It could be one year, it could be twenty years. It's got a very high variance. And U.S. has a tremendous history, both through its funding of basic research, um, as well as through its DARPA grant challenge, which I have been a beneficiary in my PhD years. And I don't see that, um, that energy, that leadership, or nor do I see that um, growing funding. I see it kind of flat, and that doesn't seem like um, the, right, the right direction. So before we spend a lot of effort dealing with the externalities, we got to still push forward as fast as we can. Sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. We have time for a couple more questions. So I'm going to come uh, here uh, and then back there. Yes. We're, we're, we're making our uh, mic carriers run as, as get as much exercise as possible. If they were robots, they wouldn't they wouldn't sweat as much. But. Good afternoon, uh, Doctor Doctor Lee and uh, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, as you know, uh, this country is a country of rebellion from the British. And after that, this country has gone on to become the top nation militarily, as well as educationally, as well as economically. What I'm, say what I'm saying, I guess, is that artificial intelligence is a great creation. And it came out from the United States. And the United States has got many Nobel Prize winners. On the other hand, China is doing very well on AI. But why the Chinese people are worried about one thing. AI will have what we call human resources displacement. In other words, the policy of face recognition and voice recognition would displace the individuals who, who are rebellious against the government. Okay. So I'm, I'm thinking, is the intelligentsia in China, such as in AI, uh, making a case to the government that they should liberalize the education system, and at the same time, they should liberalize the political system? Because after all, Karl Marx's rebellion brought China to what it is today. So rebellion is not a bad thing. 
So that's a question for you. Thanks. I see. I, I, I don't think I would be in a position to make that <laughs> argument uh, to the Chinese government. And, and I'm not, I, I, I think, I'm, but the other half of your uh, position about uh, education, I think, um, is something that um, uh, every government wants to do. And um, um, I think today, U.S. Uh, has by far the world's best um, uh, educational institutions and research institutions. Uh, it draws the world's talent here, and it's, it's a huge ben benefit to the U.S. And um, um, also, I think all of Asian education still tend to do too much rote learning. And actually, rote learning is synonymous with routine jobs. And I, I'm very concerned about Asian-style ed education, that uh, rote learning leading to routine jobs leading to AI displacement. That combination doesn't bode well. Um, we're doing a lot in education, actually. Uh, in the coming month, hopefully, you'll see me on 60 Minutes talking about how we're using AI um, to help education. Uh, not so much to, uh, partly to use AI, uh, basically to use AI to do the repetitive routine part of the teacher's job, um, that of uh, grading exams, grading homeworks, teaching, fixing English accents and, and drilling on math exercises, and then letting the teacher have more free time to self-improve, to uh, have one-on-one -on -one relationships and become better mentors and teachers. So that, I think, something that is something uh, that AI can, can do immediately, actually. I was just at World Bank this morning. I think they were very interested in other developing countries seeing if that could help education throughout the world. All right, we have time for one more uh, question, and I'm going to go to the gentleman in the back, about five rows. Yes. And uh, sorry that we couldn't get as many, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, my name is Patrick Lazad. I'm a director at Albright Stonebridge Group in the China practice. I have a quick question for you with relation to security and how it will impact AI internal to China. So the Chinese government places a strong emphasis on security and recent laws like the China cybersecurity law, as well as regulations limiting the use of foreign technology through things like secure and controllable mandates have come out that could limit the options of AI companies. So for example, in autonomous drive, Driving, the government has said that they want to limit all foreign components in the field of autonomous driving, particularly chips. How do you think these security concerns will impact the development of AI technology inside of China? Will it slow it down to some degree? Um, if, chi if, if, if China didn't, weren't so powerful and rich, it would obviously slow it down. But I think these... Um, I, would, I, I don't know too much about these two particular regulations. I presume there has been study that local substitutes can be made. Um, in, otherwise, it, because China really does put uh, technology advancement at very high priority. And if making such a thing would slow down its techn technology, I don't think that that's likely. There's a lot of money going in to semiconductor, into sensors. You know, Shenzhen is the, uh, the world's ca capital in, in building everything. Um, I, I, think, I do think um, in a lot of areas, uh, China will be able to make uh, similar parts. I'm not advocating or denouncing the policy. I'm just stating objectively that China can probably do a lot of the similar things. Um, and uh, semiconductor is probably the single exception that's going to take maybe a decade. Uh, or longer, um, so so we'll see. You know, uh, when I f uh, was younger, the f the first uh, book I read about the high tech world and where we were going was the Toffler's Third Wave, and uh, let us imagine what that era would be like with, with electronic cottages and things. And um, it's one of the in reasons I'm still interested in high tech and, and why it's so important to pay attention to, because you're basically setting the agenda for what public policy ought to be grappling with in a very different world. Uh, your book is really agenda setting. It probably, for some people, is going to spark uh, some fears and concerns. Uh, but I came away hopeful even with the problems, because it seems to me uh, there's, there's solutions or that we need to work uh, to solve them, uh, which is what we're trying to do here at CSIS. Thank you so much for coming to Washington and CSIS, and uh, we look forward to the second book uh, when it's ready. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Please join me in thanking Kai Fu. Thank you. Thank you.